Good morning, everyone. I'm Kat Agri from BookPage, and I'm thrilled to be chatting today with Ellie Williams, our January issue cover star and author of The Liar's Dictionary, an utter delight for word lovers. Uh, she's also the author of the beloved story collection, A Trib and Other Stories, and teaches at Royal Holloway, University of London. Welcome, Ellie. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much for having me. That's uh, I've never been introduced as a cover star before, so I'm really taking it in my stride. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your patience while we figure out our, our first Facebook Live. I'm just so thrilled that it's with you. This book is just, it's such a, here's the cover, by the way. It's gorgeous. And it's just, it's such a fun book for people who love language. It's the story of two lexicographers, one in the 19th century, the other in the present day, and they're tied together by mound weasels. So there's this Twitter account that automatically tweets every time the New York Times includes a word for the first time. And on January 5th, there was mount weasels. So first, how does it feel to change the world? And <laughs> second, um, this, this makes me feel more validated in having never heard of mount weasels before. Um, so tell us, what are they? How did you first learn about them? And are they actually as little known as I think they are. Um, I love the idea of uh, the offices of the New York Times at the moment. It's not a busy time, is it, in the news? So I'm glad that I can make my mark and leave my legacy there with, with Mount Weasels entering their, uh, their lexicon. Um, so Mount Weasels, um, many of you may have, have heard of them. Um, more likely you may have heard of trap streets. So um, they're copyright traps, basically. Trap streets are the equivalent in uh, cartography and map making uh, and it's that um, strange insertion by a lexicographer or a cartographer into a reference book into a body of work where you make up a word or you make up a street on a map um, and it's included so that um, uh, basically to catch out any would-be pirates of the text um, and I found out about them it honestly it was either through wikipedia uh, where you can trust everything obviously um or there was a an article that appeared in the new yorker i think in 2005 by henry alford and it was about one of these particular mount weasels that was being uh flushed out what does someone do with the weasel um it was being uh realized uh, that had appeared in the new oxford american dictionary um and the idea of these fake words, these fictitious entries being included in the columns of reference books, things that we're meant to trust, just excited me, just intrigued me. Um, and I thought that it might make a, an interesting site for, for fiction and for considering what it is to be truthful or what it is to be deceptive when um, doing your best to make sense of the world. So uh, leading into that, you know, the two main characters in the two timelines one is doing the manufacturing and one is doing the investigating um and i, I love the balance there uh, i would love to you know what is the, the what's the inspiration for these two characters uh what do you love about them i guess in a way i was considering how, how do i think about a dictionary often to me they feel quite um dry and dusty and, and um, monolithic is the word that often comes to mind about them, uh, that I don't often think of, of the humans involved in their manufacture, in their production, in the decisions that have been made in terms of bringing out a dictionary or conceiving of a dictionary um, and the legwork involved. And the more that I thought about it, the more that I researched it, the idea that, especially in the 19th century, both in England and in, um, in America, that it became less and less about one, usually a man, deciding that he would be able to define words in a certain way and then allow people to have the uh, beneficial, sweet uh, reception of, of his great wisdom, but rather it became about clerks. It became about a lot of people being involved for the seeking out of defining language as it is actively used um, throughout uh, the, the English speaking world. Um, and I was intrigued between, about, I was really intrigued about what relationships those individuals working on a dictionary might have to the dictionary, whether they were um, passionate about words, whether they were bored by words and it was uh, that kind of harmless drudgery that 
Samuel Johnson talks about in being a lexicographer. Um, and then thinking about how, because dictionaries, often much like language itself, becomes an institution, um, and institutions both change over time, but are often quite rigid. Um, what does it mean for a modern day realization of that same institution to still be affecting individuals? And what, what relationship might therefore be had between that lexicographer of the past and the new steward of language um, mm -hmm. who is still in that publishing house or with that dictionary? Um, and often, that makes it sound like, in a way, it could be a, a almost a ghost story that one is haunting the other. Um, it is also, as you say, kind of a, a pursuit as well that um, the contemporary modern day character is trying to work out who on earth is the person behind these fake words, behind these fictitious entries, um, and trying to summon an idea of him or patch together an idea of him through the clues that are left through his uh, fictional insertions. Um, so that that was the the balance I was trying to strike between them, or the um, I don't know the the relationship and the the pulling of of ropes and teasing out of threads that they're both sharing. Um, I just love that. And another thing that is um, you know people who love your story collection um, will find much about um, the love of words from that collection. They'll find that in this book as well. And I just felt like while reading The Liar's Dictionary that there's this, I just began to feel, notice a connection between love of words and romantic love or um, maybe attraction. Um, you know, especially when, you know, there's moments of like bumbling through uh, a flirtation or a crush or moments of rejection. Um, you know, those times when it's the most difficult to say exactly what you want to say, how exactly you want to say it. Um, it makes me wonder, you know, was it an, a, a trying to write about love that led you to a deeper love of words or was it vice versa? What's the connection there for you? I think that's a really interesting question um, and, and difficult to answer, almost demonstrating the problem that I have. That I think that I don't know, often feeling a, a love of language or a curiosity around language and, and how it functions and how it could be used or misused. Sometimes that can feel like an indulgence. Sometimes it can feel as if one is just reveling in the idea of language rather than actually using it to communicate well or properly or meaningfully. Um, and similarly, love can be a bit like that sometimes. It can feel as if one it, it is easy to be in love with being in love rather than to actually be able to tell someone that you love someone or be able to do something with that feeling um that actually is more to do with with a, a healthy communication rather than um maybe a, a more distracting one or anxiety producing one um i think for me probably uh, a love of language comes from an unpacking of this idea of miscommunication and the fact that we as human beings can be confident, we can be tentative, we can be assertive, we can be fumbling. Um, and those can be linguistic as much as they can be emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt in the novel and, and with my short stories that often my narrators and the characters that I have, they tend to be not on the margins of things, but in the wings a little bit. They're um, observing how the world is uh, carrying on, how things are happening around them, rather than necessarily being active in the world or able to activate or change or advocate themselves. They, they're somewhat stymied. Um, and I wanted to see how far those could be brought into parallel, the fact that they might feel stymied or plodding in their experience of being in love or curtailed or unable in their experience of, of love. And similarly with language, whether that's because they have to, in one of my characters' cases, um, feign a lisp when they're talking, mm -hmm. um, and with another character where they feel they're not able to know what words are appropriate for themselves. Um, so certainly I think the two run in parallel with one another and I think love and language often often do. 
one of my favorite things that you talk about in our in our cover story with you um, is uh, how you learn to love uh, the mutability of language. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's such a beautiful thing to see um, or to think about love as, and while also acknowledging um, the necessity for it to change. Um, and, you know, isn't that just like love or what we hope from love, um, to love something while allowing it to change and grow? And isn't that how we want to be loved in return? Um, what does that balance mean to you? I think that whether it's a, a balance or, or a seeking out, um, I guess in, in saying seeking out, I think that love can often feel like you're on a quest, that you're out to either prove something or you're going to be able to help someone in a very particular way. Um, sorry about the sounds in the background. That's my dog who loves me trying to get in and be the cameo star of this. Oh. Um, <laughs> but I think that um, it often, rather than it being a quest where there can be something um, achieved or something found or something won, um, it's more about pursuit, whether that's a pursuit to be able to uh, make oneself clear um, or a pursuit to make oneself safe. Um, again, I think that's a, a parallel between love, love and language and how difficult it often is that, that there's a reason that so many songs have lines like love isn't easy. Um, that if it was easy, it probably wouldn't feel like it was worth it. Mm -hmm. um, but no, love in all of its forms, I think, um, should be celebrated. And one day we'll probably have the right words for all of it. <laughs> Maybe. Um, kind of on that note, be, you know, because wordplay is so on point in your books, it feels like you're, it's easy, it would be easy to make the assumption that you are the kind of person all, who always has the right word in the rights in in a situation um are you i think you can tell by the way that i do lots of non-verbal kind of miming of <laughs> possible answers to questions when i'm on the spot um no i very often have the right word i probably have about 1200 words that fall out of my mouth that i think are kind of circling around the right word um but usually in a very associative rather than useful way um, I think I'm very, I admire people that have control of the reins of language or think that they do. Mm -hmm. um, often I suspect it's a lot of bluster that I'm just being taken in uh, because it's being performed well rather than necessarily as much uh, beneath the rhetoric that is meaningful. But um, no, I very rarely have the right word at the right time. Um, and maybe I'm suspicious of people that do. <laughs> so you're clearly an animal person. Um... And to be, but to be honest, I have a personal, um, not vendetta, but I, I just get, it's, I get irritated when animals are used as literary devices to like help define something for the human characters and never once have you done that. Um, I think maybe because you find animals funny. I don't know. There's, I mean, for those who haven't read the Liar's Dictionary, there is the single most preposterous pelican scene you'll ever read. But also there's, you know, there's pigeons in your books and hedgehogs and rats and all these other animals. Um, you know, what are animals to you in your stories? How are they serving you? How are you thinking of them as characters? Um, I think because often my stories do orbit or, or center on uh, the use and misuse of language um, and communication, I think that animals often because they are unable in a necessarily explicitly understandable verbal sense to communicate. Um, the ways in which people project their emotions, their meanings, their um, attempts or, or feints at, at understanding um, through their encounters with animals and the behavior of animals, um, that as you say, the animals don't have to exist there as an allegory or as a um, motif onto which the, the human agents and characters can um, allow their motivations or their desires to be meted through. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm really interested in, in how other authors have, have used animals um, to underline or distract from elements of plot and from action. Um, both in fiction and in nonfiction, there's uh, the 
brilliant new book or newest book by Helen McDonald, a, a British writer, um, Vesper Flights. Oh, I love out. it. Right, extraordinary. Um, and obviously her, her memoir, H is for Hawk as well. Um, and then also, uh, I don't know if you've read it, and I hope I get the surname right here, but Eleanor Passarello um, and her Animal Strike Curious Poses. Um, with a series of essays about how human beings and animals through time and through art and um, through various iconography are attempting a syncing up uh, or are attempting to find reasons why we seek out uh, some kind of estimation of, of ourselves or how we understand the world through experiences and encounters with the natural world and with animals. Um, and both of those writers write so well about the impossibility of that and that it it is maybe illogical to attempt to do that. And I think through fiction, you can concentrate upon those, those difficulties and those friction tension moments where animals are not pitted against humans and humans aren't necessarily in control of animals, but they're both trying to find affinities with one another uh, in, in the text. So we have a question from the audience. Someone wants to know, when you were a child, did you read dictionaries and were you always fascinated by language? Um, I always feel like I have to claim to my shame. Yes, I did. But I think we all did to an extent. It's it's not that I ever had a favorite dictionary that I'd get down and read cover to cover, <laughs> A to Z, um, but that it's very tricky once you're in the midst of looking a word up in the dictionary for your eye not to gently glide across to the page facing whatever you're looking up and then finding a new word that you never knew existed and suddenly becomes the perfect word and the crucial word that justifies your whole existence up until that moment. Um, and we definitely, uh, when I was growing up, had some dictionaries by the by the uh, kitchen table just at hand, mm -hmm. if ever we wanted those little uh, epiphanies uh, in a very small muted way. Um, and I think um, I'm glad I had those moments. I think I think I mentioned in in the uh, interview that's that's um, you very kindly have have printed that um, nowadays I am more likely as I think maybe we all are, to use my phone dictionary or to just do a quick Wikipedia of, of a word that I'm unsure of um, on the laptop. And that has less of a browsing sense to it, this sense of falling across or stumbling across um, a word that you had no need for at the time, but just were delighted by. Um, and that you could lose time to doing that. Um, definitely I've lost time to Wikipedia don't get me wrong but that idea of words in particular being and words and their definitions in particular being um, just ready and and waiting on a page that you weren't necessarily seeking out I missed that I think and I, I'm glad that I had that that growing up with with physical dictionaries do you have a favorite word I am a big fan of pamphlet. Um, I think it almost sounds onomatopoeic. I think if I shook a pamphlet under, under your nose, then uh, you'd, you'd hear the word pamphlet, even in the act of it. I think that probably is my favorite word. Do you have, Do you have a favorite word? So I was thinking about this, and I don't know that I have a favorite word, but I have words that get stuck in my head like an <laughs> earworm, like a song. Mm. Um, and the one that I don't think has left my head since I first let, read Lord of the Rings in middle school was the name Saruman. And I think oh. I have read the name Saruman in my head over and over <laughs> again for, for decades. That's all I could think of. That's, I mean, if that was a character in Lord of the Rings, that would be very sinister that that is the name that's just threaded through your experience of for the my world. my entire life. Yeah. That's interesting because actually one of the words from the Lord of the Rings that I, that as you say, kind of earworms as a verb, um, palantir, oh. uh, just that's such a, a beautiful word to say. It has such a spring to it, as you say it. And I think that's now being used by a tech company for, um, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think uh, online meetings mm -hmm. um, and the idea that it has this new life. Uh, with something that I probably now associate more with with admin rather than this sense of extraordinary scrying from between uh, different topographies. Um, yeah, words having new agency and, and new life. Well, I love that so much. Thank you so much for being with us today. I've just loved talking with you. 
Um, Thank you. And everyone go read this fabulous book. Thank you so much. Thanks. Okay.